Hey everybody, it's me, Braylon Rising, and today I'm back with another true crime video. This one's going to be a little bit different from my others because this is not one case. This is one case that uncovered something police were not expecting. This is about a serial killer who has still not been charged. There are some suspects that I think are pretty applicable for being the serial killer, but I think just police have not gotten enough evidence to arrest them yet. This video is going to be super long. I have about like 18 pages of notes, so I'm gonna need y'all to bear with me, and it could be in two parts. I'm not sure. We're gonna have to figure that out towards the end, but you guys will know once it's uploaded. Um, there's also a lot of names. There's going to be a lot of people. So I'm going to need y'all to all stay along with me, you know, try and bear through with me and also pay attention because you do not want to miss any of the evidence because there's a lot in every single person. So without further ado, Let's jump into the Long Island serial killer. The beaches in New York are all connected by Ocean Parkway and the beaches that are made up of this are Oak Beach, Jones Beach, and Gilgo Beach. Now the Long Island serial killer was suspected to kill as many as 10 to 16 people. But in 2010, these beaches were the dumping grounds for the serial killer and it would not come to light until 2010, 2011 of what these dumping grounds actually were and what they uncovered. These killings are said to have gone back as far as 1982 and speculated to have stopped sometime in 2013. Now we're gonna jump in to the first case, I guess I could say, that uncovered all of this. Literally just this one case uncovered so much that police were not expecting. So we're gonna jump into that and that is the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert. Shannon Gilbert was 24 years old and she lived in New Jersey, Jersey City, and she was struggling to work minimum wage jobs. She just didn't like it and she liked the luxury and lifestyle that she could have if when she was sex working. She liked all the money she would get and she just didn't like what she was making at these minimum wage jobs and how many she was having to work. Shannon dropped out of high school around the age of 16 and enrolled herself in nursing classes but soon dropped out of that too and was trying to find jobs anywhere that she could. She tried restaurants, she even tried senior centers, senior centers, I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. But she ended up landing a job as a secretary at a school, but ultimately this was just not what she wanted and she ended up leaving this job as well and became a sex worker. Shannon actually started soliciting herself on the website as we all know today as Craigslist and this is where she got her client. She ended up landing a client with a man named Joseph Brewer who was 45 years old and he was a financial advisor and he lived in a really nice gated community up in Oak Beach. Now she was like this is a hell of a deal, you know, I'm, he lives in a gated community, he must have a lot of money. Now Shannon wanted this job because she wanted to get her mother, whose name was Mari, a birthday present. She just didn't want to get her an average birthday present. She wanted to give her something that she could remember and she thought this gig would be the perfect one to help get her a really nice gift for her mother. Her and her mother had a very estranged relationship throughout Shannon's whole life. It turned into when she was a young kid that she was actually put into the foster care system. Shannon's mother, Mari, claimed that this was all due to Shannon's bipolar disorder, which, I don't know, I feel like parents, I feel like that just sounds like she's giving up on her, which, don't even get me started on that. Also at the time, Shannon had an apparent eating disorder, and this is why Mari claimed that she was just too difficult to care for and that's ultimately why she ended up in foster care system which is so sad that parents, some parents are like this. I can't even begin to describe how alone I'd be feeling if I was Shannon at that age. And at age 12 she was prescribed bipolar medication but she refused to take them because she did not, not like the way that they made her feel. It was also speculated that the real reason Mari sent Shannon to foster care was because 
Shannon and Mari's at the time boyfriend when not getting along and is just suspected that she sent her there because of that, which I completely could see because I just don't know any parent that would abandon their child because of their disorders that they can't help. That's just really sad. Mari and Shannon never saw eye to eye and they became closer as Shannon got a little bit older and Mari learned of what Shannon was doing with her job, which was sex working, and she told her she needed to stop. And when she learned that Shannon was doing this gig to get Mari a birthday present, Mari said, you know, just seeing me is a good enough gift. But Shannon just did not want to do that. She wanted to get her mom a really nice gift. So that night she set off to meet Joseph Brewer on May 1st, 2010. And it was around 2 a.m. when her hired driver, picked her up and took her off to Joseph's house. Shannon hired drivers because she felt it would secure her and just give her higher security, knowing that they would be waiting out there for her all night, which I understand. But when Shannon got to Joseph's house, it was some neighbors said he was having a party, some said he was home alone, but while she went in around 2 a.m., her hired driver, who I believe his name was Pac, actually stayed in the car and played online poker on his phone while Shannon went inside. Soon 911 would receive a call from Shannon Gilbert's cell phone and it would be just groundbreaking. It was the last that anyone would ever hear of Shannon. And in an interview with 48 Hours, former Suffolk County's Chief of Detectives Dominic Veroni said the following about the 911 call Shannon had placed that night. She's saying there's someone after me, there's someone after me. He said it's a girl that believes that she's in harm's way. Detective Veroni also pointed out that in this phone call he could hear two male voices which he believed was Pac the hired driver and Joseph and it seemed as if Joseph was trying to get her out of his house. Detective Veroni said quote, he either approaches her or touches her. You can hear her scream out. While this is happening, Shannon remained on the phone with the 911 operator and ended up running to a nearby neighbor's house. The man's house that she arrived at was a man named Gus Coletti and she was just screaming, help me, help me. And he got on the phone with 911 and was trying to help her, but Shannon was just frantic and ran off to the other neighbor's houses. It was unsure or unclear of why Shannon was freaking out so much and after 23 minutes, the 911 call went dead. And when police arrived on scene, they could not find Shannon Gilbert anywhere. Police considered Joseph Brewer at the time a suspect. He had solicited many other sex workers on the Craigslist website, but it is unknown if any other sex workers that he has been with has disappeared at all. So he was a suspect, but um, he was ultimately cleared due to lack of evidence. Two days after Shannon's disappearance, her mother claimed she got a call from Joseph Brewer's neighbor who was named Dr. Peter Hackett. Dr. Peter Hackett had a past and he was a detective for a while, but was let go due to spreading false information and he ended up embarrassing all the colleagues and he would lie a lot and that's ultimately what got him let go. But he was known to insert himself in a lot of news things just to get attention on him and if you've watched other cases, you see a lot of people that will implement themselves into cases and even sometimes say that they did it, but just did that out of wanting attention. So it's unknown what his true intentions were with this call, but on this call, he claimed that Shannon, he was running a home for wayward runaway girls and that Shannon had run away to this home. He claimed he drugged Shannon at this home and it is unclear why he would even make this statement but police assume that it was just him making stuff up considering there was zero evidence tying him to her disappearance. Mari was still on search for a missing daughter and she ridiculed police for not doing more than they probably should have. But soon a police officer and his dog would change this whole investigation. The search for Shannon continued throughout the summer of 2010 and soon the Suffolk County Police Missing Persons Bureau would enlist a man who was 59 year old vet veteran officer John Malia and his dog who was a canine officer Blue. 
Malia had a reputation for, my, for finding the most exclusive, elusive escaped prisoners and also murder victims. His dog was seven years old and like I said, a German Shepherd who was named Blue and he knew he would find Shannon. He just knew it inside of him that he was going to find her. He even told New York Times in 2011, I assumed we would find her. I assumed she was dead. Nobody had a clue. Mally and Blue spent the rest of their time searching the com gated community of Oak Beach and soon moved their way down to Ocean Parkway, thinking that Shannon could have run off. He even searched for Shannon in his off hours, which just helped aid the search so much more. And in this searching of his off hours, he would uncover something, like I said, police were not expecting. Malia recall, recalled to the New York Times that it was known that killers would drop bodies off 30 feet away from a road, or if they did put it by a road, it'd be 30 feet away from it. And the brush along the Ocean Parkway was pretty thick, and Malia saw this as a perfect dumping ground if it was one, or at least a place where he could find maybe anything of Shannon's. And so he searched it. On December 11th, 2010, around 3.11, Malia's dog was fixated on something, and it was a smell of death. And once Blue, just once he let Blue search for whatever he was smelling, they came across a burlap sack. And once Malia opened it, he found the remains of a human skeleton lying inside. And when searching 500 feet away from the burlap sack they had just found, they found another one. So once Malia and his dog got news of this, they searched more around this area and were able to locate two more bodies in burlap sacks. The body count was now up to four and slowly growing. But these four bodies that were found were now known and known as today as the Gilgo Four. Now it was speculated at first that one of these bodies have to be Shannon's because that's what they were looking for, that's who they were looking for, and just one of them had to be. But later identifying the bodies, they learned that none of these were in fact Shannon's. And on March 29th, 2011, another set of human remains would be found. The body count was now up to five, still counting, and on April 4th, 2011, three more bodies would be discovered and still none of them belong to Shannon. Police speculated that whoever had killed all these bodies or these victims were definitely by the same killer. They also speculated that he worked there, he lived there, he knew the area, he knew our Ocean Parkway, and he was not someone to pick out. You know, he was not a blue collar type of guy. This was someone who was trusted, someone possibly with kids or married. This was someone you could not just pick out of a crowd. After searching this area for a while, police wanted to expand their search and so they moved their search down to Nassau County where on April 11th, 2011, police would find bones and jewelry belonging to a woman near Jones Beach Water Tower, as well as another skull belonging to a woman near Topi Beach. These remains still did not belong to Shannon, and now police were starting to speculate if possibly this was at the hands of two killers with how many bodies there were. I mean, the body count was now up to 10, and they just didn't know how one person had gotten away with this for so long, or how they didn't even notice all these victims turn up missing. Suffolk County Police would still continue their search for Shannon on December 7th, 2011. Shannon's purse, photo ID, jeans, shoes, and cell phone were all located in the marshland. Now, since they found this in the marshland, this intensified their search there, and soon they would find a set of remains in a swampy part of the marshland. This marshland was located near Oak Beach, and when police were going to identify who this was, they found it was Shannon. And at the time they speculated she had died from drowning. On December 15th, 2011, two days after Shannon's body was found, an aquarium owner named James Bissett committed suicide. People of the town speculated that he did this because Shannon's body was just found and maybe he had been a part of the murders but police found that he had zero ties to any of the murders and he was ultimately cleared as a suspect. On November 30th, 2011, police told 
everybody in the town that they actually didn't suspect that maybe this was at the hands of two people, but actually one. But they learned that all these victims had similar traits to Shannon. They were all sex workers. All four of the bodies found on Gilgal Beach were all belonged to female sex workers who solicited themselves on Craigslist, similar, similar to Shannon, and out of all the bodies found, they were only able to identify five by name, which we are going to jump into now. Now, once I explain this, I'm gonna be explaining it in the order that police were able to identify. So please bear with me. And again, there's going to be a lot of names. So just try and pay attention. The first to be identified was the body of 25 year old Marina Barnes. She was one of the Gilgo Four and her body was found on December 2010. She was last seen July 9th, 2007 and she was taking a trip from Connecticut to New York City. She had her first child whose name was Caitlin at the age of 16. She married her child's father, Jason Barnes in 1999 and they divorced in 2001 and she ended up moving in with her sister, Missy, who lived in Connecticut and she just tried getting as many jobs as she could. She worked as a pizza delivery and then she looked, worked as a card dealer at a local casino. She also even got a job as a supermarket cashier. But as summer was coming to an end, Marina was just bored of her summer jobs and wanted something more. She wanted to pursue her dreams as a rapper. So she started promoting her music on a site called MySpace, which is not round today, but it is just like Facebook if you're unsure of what that is. And while she was on here, trying to promote her music, she saw modeling ads for a website named modelingmayhem.com. And she found this as a perfect opportunity to maybe pursue modeling as well while trying to work towards her rapping career. She, Marina got her friend to take a bunch of pictures for her to start a portfolio and she ended up uploading them to this site and she was receiving a ton of feedback, but mostly from nude modeling companies. And this did not bother her at all because she was just focusing on what she was getting back. She liked what she was hearing. She didn't care about the precautions or anything that she was going to have to do. This website was actually sued multiple times for several allegations of disappearances of young girls and also sexual assault allegations. She was also receiving money from doing this. And so, like I said, she was enjoying this. She was making money and doing something that was fairly easy for her. And she even saw on Google how much somebody could make being a web camera, which is if you don't know what that is, you're too young to be here. She also saw how much somebody could make as being an escort, and she didn't like this idea at first, but she started kind of letting on to it after she stumbled upon Craigslist and saw all these other girls soliciting themselves on there, and she decided, you know what? I'm gonna do it. And so she made her own Craigslist ad to be a sex worker. She also wanted to do this on Craigslist because on the modelingmayhem.com, she was not making 100% of the profits. You see the modelingmayhem.com would take a percentage of her profits considering they were help promoting her. So on Craigslist, she liked the idea that she was able to make 100% of these profits. She also went by the name Murray on this online ad. In 2006, Marina ended up having another child and it was her son and it was still unknown who the father is, but he ended up buying or paying for an apartment for Marina and the son to live in. So she was secure there. And ultimately soon, Sarah Carnes, a friend of Marina, was let go from her aquarium job. And Marina saw this as a perfect opportunity to have her friend Sarah drive her to these, wherever she was working or escorting herself and thought this would be perfect, again, for higher security. I think it was a lot of people that would have higher drivers to stay there with them through the night in the car just to make sure nothing happened. Sarah was ultimately the last person to see Marina on July 9th, 2007, after Marina had checked in to a Super 8 motel to do one of her jobs. And it's, some say that before she disappeared that she had checked out of the Super 8 Motel, but it is unconfirmed. A couple days after Marina had disappeared, Sarah actually got a blocked call number from her phone and it was a man saying that Marina was at a whorehouse. And when Sarah exclaimed that 
Marina would not ever be at a whorehouse. The caller said, well, I saw her there and then continued to explain Marina's appearance to a T. Sarah noted that the person had no native accent to the area, but accentuated his S's and T's and spoke very properly. It is still unknown who this caller is and what the message was behind it. The next murder investigation of the Gilgo Beach Four was a woman named Melissa Bartholomew and she was 24 years old and she was last seen sitting on a curb outside of her Bronx apartment in which she shared with her five cats. She as well as others sought sex work on Craigslist in 2009. She was from Buffalo, New York, and soon she moved to the Bronx with her boyfriend. She attended beauty school in Buffalo, and once she moved to the Bronx with her boyfriend, she was offered a job as a hair cutting stylist. This was just at a local salon. I'm unsure if she actually took up on the job offer or not, but we are sure that she continued her sex work through Craigslist and also on an online page called James Bond Entertainment. She used the name Chloe on these ads and on July 10th, 2009, Melissa, after her last gig, had deposited $900 into her bank account and after that she had disappeared from her Bronx curb right outside of her apartment and the next time she would be found was being pulled out of a burlap sack. Her boyfriend at the time, who was named Terry, claimed that he had called her multiple times after she disappeared because they always kept close contact with each other and this was just very unlike her. And he grew increasingly worried and after he was still not getting zero reply from Melissa, he claimed he went to police and tried to file her a missing person but was declined. And I could totally see this. I really don't think he's lying here. I've seen so many cases, especially with older women or especially with sex workers where police just turn their heads. They could not give two fucks more, which is insanely sad. But I really think that what, what he's saying here is true and I don't think he's a suspect at all in her disappearance. One week after Melissa's disappearance, her younger sister, Amanda, claimed that she had gotten a phone call from Melissa's phone and when she answered, she claimed that it sounded like an older white male who asked if she was Melissa's little sister and when she replied yes, he continued to go on and just go off her and call her vulgar, horrible names as well as her sister. The call had lasted for over three minutes and ended. These calls continued once a week for about a month. Police were trying to narrow down where this caller was calling from, but once they tried tracking where the phone was pinging off of, it led to very busy places like Madison Square, Times Square, and this was just making it very difficult for police to narrow it down. So this caller was obviously smart enough to go use Melissa's phone in an open place where police wouldn't just be able to narrow it down to a house, perhaps, you know, per se. And on August 26, 2009, the last call from this man came and when Amanda had answered the call that had came from her sister's phone, the man on the other end said to her, I've killed her, I've killed Melissa. Melissa's ex-boyfriend, Terry, who we just talked about, also came forward and claimed that he was also getting these calls too. He said it happened for over eight months where he would get these calls and the man would just call him and start yelling at him and just being very vulgar. And he said that most of the time he sounded like he was drunk. But then he started threatening him and it seemed as if the man on the other phone knew things about Terry. I mean, he described the tattoos on his back and everything. And it's just really freaked Terry out. And he said, he seemed to know who I was. He knew I had two tattoos on my back. Maybe he felt like she was doing something he didn't like. And police hopped on this idea that maybe this serial killer was killing all these sex workers because he simply just did not like what they were doing. But that was the end of Melissa's. And now we're going to be going into the next of the Gilgo Four, whose name was Megan Waterman. 22-year-old sex worker Megan Waterman would be the next of the many Long Island serial killings to go missing. At the time of Megan's disappearance, she had been sharing a hotel room at Holiday Inn in Hoplog, Long Island with her boyfriend whose name was Akeem Cruz. She was last seen on security footage leaving her hotel room around 1.30 a.m. 
She was one of the many found on along Ocean Parkway in December 2010. Now Megan had grown up in Maine with her grandmother whose name was Muriel. Now Megan's actual mother whose name was Loretta, her and her had just had an estranged relationship. I mean Muriel who was you know, Megan's grandmother had actually reported Loretta many times to the state for being an unfit mother. Muriel gave Loretta an ultimatum. She must sign over the full custody over of her children to Muriel, otherwise she would not have visitation rights. And Loretta agreed against the advice of her lawyer. In 2005, Megan stopped attending school and ended up having a lot of run-ins with the law after that. She was arrested for having a marijuana pipe on her and then she was also arrested for stalking and then public intoxication. Me Megan soon found out that she was pregnant from a 32 year old DJ. It was just a one night stand in the bathroom and she ended up moving in with her mother Loretta for the time that she was pregnant and this ended up rekindling their old estranged relationship and they ended up getting a lot of closer. Megan gave birth to her daughter Liliana on September 2006 and as the as her motherhood started growing going on she found how financially difficult it was to care for a child. She was receiving $400 from the state, but this was just not enough to take care of her and her newborn daughter. Megan sadly, after being unable to provide for her daughter, had returned back to the life of sex working. On the day that she disappeared, she was meant to meet with her mother Loretta for her birthday, but it was just not meant to be. It is unknown if any of the family or relatives had received any strange calls like the other cases or any of that sort. On September 2nd, 2010, a 27 year old Amber Lynn Costello received a response on her ad on Craigslist that just exceeded her expectations. She was being offered $1,500 for sex work. Her roommate at the time was 32 year old Dave Schaller and he usually helped her do screenings and background checks on the people that she was going to do sex work with. But unfortunately on this day, I'm just guessing he wasn't around and Amber was impatient and needed this money. So she just didn't bear to ask him. She usually also set up all the appointments on her roommate's phone, making it safer for her. But again, on this day, she just didn't. It was just all the wrong reasons happening at once. Amber's rate was usually around $250. And like I said, this guy was offering her $1,500. And this just, like I said, exceeded her rate. She did not want to let this opportunity go. So she decided to not do a screening on him. She just also decided after communicating with him on the phone for a while that they would meet up before the gig. Amber was a regular user of heroin and with a demanding addiction like this, she needed the money. After she received the final call at 10 30 AM on September 2nd, she headed out the door to go meet her client. Amber often worked under the name Carolina, probably because she was from North Carolina. Amber had a rough past. She was sexually assaulted at age six, which caused her mother to go into a breakdown. Amber's sister, Kimberly, was said to say, we didn't live the American dream childhood. We watched our families struggle through alcoholism and sickness. Kimberly, her sister, also worked as a sex worker and was also a regular drug user, which if you've seen like Intervention or any of that, a little off track, but if you've seen any of those shows, you see that when there's two people that are regular hard drug users, they are extremely toxic for each other and there's no way you're gonna get out of that situation unless you separate those two. Amber started sex working at age 16 in her own neighborhood with the neighborhood boys and her first gig, she made $75. Her and her sister would attend drug parties where there would be crack, cocaine, and ecstasy, all drugs you can think of. Kimberly, her sister, was addicted to coke, and like I had said earlier, Amber was a regular user of heroin. Around 2007, they decided to move to the Gulf Coast together, and after a while, Amber was just not happy with the life she was living, and she wanted to start fresh. 
She soon married a man named Don Costello and ended up moving in with him soon after. Amber ended up landing a job in a church nursery and soon Amber and Don were trying to start a family of their own and ultimately a baby was put into the church nursery and his name was Gabriel. And he had actually, his parents had some rough outbringings with the court. They were going through some stuff with the court. And so for the time being, Don and Amber were set to foster this child and they ended up falling in love with this child and they fought for full custody of this child. But soon the child was turned back over to his biological parents and they were so attached that once this happened, it just kind of broke both of them apart. This ultimately caused Amber and Don's marriage to start crumbling and the last that he had seen her was in May 2008 when she had come by to pick up some Christmas decorations. She was later arrested for shoplifting at a local supermarket and she was shoplifting for, she was shoplifted toothpaste. Don and Amber's marriage sadly ended in March of 2009, only after 15 months and he was recalled saying, she was not truthful throughout our marriage. Amber's set court date was set for February 2010 and this made her ultimately decide to head to New York to get clean. Overstreet actually paid for her plane ticket and placed her in a drug detox program at NASA University Medical Center in 2010. Once her stay was over at the drug detox program, she moved to Long Island to stay in a sober house. But soon after leaving, she turned back to sex work, which ultimately led her right back down the path to heroin, causing her to relapse and just living the whole cycle over again. She went back on Craigslist selling herself under the name of Carolina and on the day that she had her gig when she had not returned home, her roommate had came home and noticed she wasn't there but just thought that she had gone out with a friend to go get high and would surface in about two days. Police used Kimberly, his sister, to swab her mouth and ultimately get the DNA that they needed to conclude that one of the Gilgo Four bodies was in fact Amber Lynn Costello. The Gilgo Four were now identified as Amber Lynn Costello, Megan Bartholomew, Marie Barnes, and Megan Waterman. But there were six, still six other bodies that needed to be identified. Almost 10 years before the Gilgo Four were discovered, other bodies were found along Gilgo Beach and Nassau County. On March 29, 2011, a skull, a pair of hands, and a right forearm would be found and they soon identified these body parts belonging to a victim named Jessica Taylor, who was also a sex worker at the time. Eight years previously, on July 26, 2003, Jessica's torso was actually found in a pile of branches east of Ocean Parkway in Matterville, New York. Who had dismembered Jessica, left her body in plain sight, and then transported the other parts of her body to where she was found. That just makes no sense why the killer just didn't leave her all there or leave her all somewhere else. I don't get why he put her in plain sight in Matterville, New York, and then left her completely just out in the open, or at least her other bones out in the open, unless maybe he just put all the bodies in one place and then slowly dismembered them and put them out in various places to confuse police. We will never know. Five days later, the mystery grew more complex on April 4th, 2011, when police found a head, two hands, and the right foot of another dismembered corpse that was found not too far from Jessica. Forensic testing confirmed that this other body part that was found with Jessica's was that of a Jane Doe number six, who was still unidentified. It was said that she had a tattoo on her right foot and would have been somewhere around five foot two and between the ages of 18 to 36. It was theorized police that Jane number, Doe number six was also a sex worker since she had ultimately met the same fate as Jessica Taylor, who was also a sex worker. Jessica was a known sex worker around the town and was arrested several times in Washington DC, New York City, and Atlantic City for sex working. Jessica was last seen sometime between July 18th and July 23rd. Jessica was last seen sometime between July 18th and the 23rd as she solicited herself at the Manhattan Port Authority bus terminal. It seemed Jessica and Jane Doe number six were somehow tied to the Gilgo Four, the Long Island serial killings, but Jessica actually stuck out from the others. She did not solicit herself on Craigslist. She actually only 
charge $50. So it is unknown if she is tied to the giggle for or not, or if it was just a random act. And we are still unknown if she was or not. The other sets of remains that were still unidentified that were found on April 4th, 2011 were the most unique of them all. One of them actually was identified as a man. And they assumed that he was an Asian man somewhere between the ages of 18 to 23. And they also assumed he was transgender because when they found him, he was wearing woman's clothes. They also theorized he was probably around five foot six. And also they speculated he was in poor health considering he had two molars missing as well as two incisor teeth. His remains to were to have found that his cause of death was a blunt force trauma and it was also assumed that he was as well a sex worker that just met the same fate as them all. But the most unexpected victim of them all was that of a body of a toddler that was found on April 4th, 2011, and she was found just wearing little gold earrings and a gold necklace. Police, after investigating further on this, found out that the mother of this child was Jane Doe number three, who was found 10 miles away on Jones Beach on April 11th, 2011. Police first connected the dots to these two when they found that they were both wearing the same fake gold jewelry. And once they did a DNA test, it submitted their thoughts that this was in fact the mother of this toddler. Soon police were able to identify Jane Doe number three a little bit further. They found that she was a sex worker that went by the name Peaches and they actually gave her this name because she had a peach tattoo on her and so they called her Peaches. Her death was a little bit different from the other. In June 28th, 1977, a hiker was making his regular route when he came across a green Rubbermaid container in Homestead Lake Park, Nassau County. When he opened this Rubbermaid container, he found a black bag inside and he got an inkling feeling that something was just not right, so he called police to further inspect. And when police further inspected this container, that is when they found the body of Peaches. Police determined that Peaches was an African-American woman somewhere between the ages of 20 to 30, but they did not know if this was part of the Long Island serial killings, considering this happened in 1977. It actually made them question themselves if possibly the serial killer had been killing since 1977. The final victim found near Gilgo Beach was Jane Doe number seven. The least is known about her. They only found a few teeth and a skull and she was discovered on April 11th, 2011 on Toby Beach. Her remains were linked to a garbage bag that actually contained several severed legs and she was found on Fire Island in 1966, just before Peaches had been found. And like I said, that is all we know. There is no further information on Jane Doe number seven. Going back to Shannon Gilbert's death, police were still set on possibly that Shannon was not part of the Long Island serial killings at all. They think it was a whole separate thing, which I completely don't understand. Shannon's body had been consistent with homicidal strangulation, but after both medical examiners did the autopsy on her body, her death was still ruled as undetermined. Though her murder is still unsolved and though her disappearance was insanely heartbreaking for her family, it still gave 10 other families the closure that they had been waiting for. I mean, her one disappearance launched the investigation of 10 others and opened a whole new chapter of what possibly had been going on in the area. So it is a bit bittersweet. It is still not released on what many fates these victims suffered through in their last final moments or how they died, but I'm sure that is just because the killer is still at large and police want to hold as much evidence to themselves as they can so that when they do get their suspect, they can crack them down perfectly. I feel in 10 to 20 years of this case has still not been solved, police will become desperate. We are now gonna be talking about today's time and what police are doing today to find this killer. In September, the investigation got a boost when state officials decided they would reach out to F. 
FBI to deploy genetic genealogy. This is a technique in which genetic profiles are run through a database in which help police try and find relatives of the homicidal victim or perpetrator. Police admitted that they did not know how long this process would take but just about two weeks ago, police came out with new evidence that they had found. They showed the public a photograph of a item that they had found at a crime scene that they believed belonged to the suspect or at least was handled by the suspect. And this was a belt. It was a belt that had the initials HM or WH depending on the angle. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Gerald Hart declined to say where the belt exactly was found. She said the investigators determined that the belt had not belonged to any of the victims, so they solely believed that this evidence could actually lead to their killer. She did not comment on whether they believed this killings were still at the hands of one person or multiple, so this is all speculation for our own. But now we're gonna get into the suspects that we have right now, and there's honestly not that many, but there are some that I feel are very, very suspicious. The most speculated suspect in this case is one that even when you go to Google this case, his picture will come up and it, Wikipedia is like, this is the guy but he's just not been charged. But we are not for sure because police had not made any moves yet. But this man who is a suspect in this case is, the, is a man named John Biltroff, an American convicted murderer. John was born in 1966, making him today somewhere in his 50s. He was from New York and lived there at the time of the murders that he has now been convicted and charged with. He was charged in July 2014 for the murders of two women by the name of Rita Tangrini and Colleen McName. I'm sorry if I'm getting any of those names wrong. I'm probably butchering them. Please don't come after me. He is also the suspect of another murdered woman named Sandra Costilla. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences and he became a suspect in the LISK murders when his brother, Timothy, was actually linked with DNA technology as the relative. So what I mean by that is when police went to go test the DNA he was found to have a probably 50-50 match, which showed police that he was not the killer, but he was related to whoever the killer was. The DNA that they used was actually found on one of the bodies that, which ultimately linked John Biltroff to this. And at the time, he was actually a carpenter and he lived in Manorville which is actually where Jessica Taylor's torso had been found at the time, as well as Jane Doe number six were recovered. He was also a hunter and seemed to oddly really love killing and mutilating the animals. He was said to one time have shot a deer in the woods, cut out his heart and ate it Raw. Another link that could tie John Biltroff to the list killings was one of the women that he murdered named Rita Tangrini was actually best friends with Melissa Bartholomew, one of the first, or Gilgalfor, one of the first bodies that were found in the Lisk murders. Melissa's mother also had reported that Melissa had been making a lot of calls to Manorville at the time before she had died, which is, like I said, where John Biltroff lived at the time. Now, like I said, there are not a lot of suspects in this case, and I just wanted to share John's because he seems like the most credible suspect and really could be the actual murderer. And I don't wanna share, you know, 50 other suspects because most of the time in videos when people share suspects, you can clearly tell they're not suspects and it's kind of just a waste of time to even put their name out there and make them look like a bad person when they're honestly probably not. I think police haven't done anything with this lead or possibly haven't gone through with a suspect because they probably just have zero evidence that can substantially put somebody in jail. And I'm guessing they don't wanna, you know, bring somebody in and, you know, put all this information out of them and then possibly have a flight risk. So I understand what they're doing. I think they're taking their time trying to build a case against whoever 
they have on their suspect. I was surprised that I personally had never heard of the Long Island serial killings. Never in my life have I heard of it, but it actually came out that sometime in March, Netflix will actually be releasing a film based on the Long Island serial killing. That is it for this case today. I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys made it through. Please let me know what you think. If you are interested, please have or are opening up a website where you can share tips or anything about this case to help aid their investigation and it will be gilgonews.com which will it will also post updates like I said you can also put tips on there so anything to help them I hope someone out there who's watching this has a refreshed memory and possibly knows something and if you do please 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 go to that website and let them know or you can call the Suffolk County Police Department and let them know there as well please leave a like comment and subscribe I really want to know what you guys think on my videos, how I'm doing on it. I really need feedback. I really want to know. Please leave your case suggestions in the comments down below. I will see you all next week in the next video.